Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly podcast. Before we start today's show, a word for one of our partners, How's At Travel. How's At is a specialist in cricket travel with years of experience taking fans all over the world to bucket list events and once in a lifetime destinations. Join them for the much anticipated eighth edition of the ICC Men's T20 World Cup played at prestigious venues all over Australia. Take a look at their travel packages to follow England for the entirety of their tour, as well as packages covering all Super 12 games, excluding Perth. All their packages include guaranteed match tickets, hotel accommodation with breakfast, as well as the option to add international flights and much, much more. Head to howsattravel.co.uk to find out more. By the time you listen to this episode, the second edition of the 100 will have begun. We'll talk a little, about, a li- we'll talk a little bit about that. England's test squad for the first two South Africa tests, the England South Africa T20Is, the Commonwealth Games and much more. I'm Yaz Rana, and with me today is the magazine editor of Wisden Cricket Monthly, Joe Harmon, and the editor-in-chief of Wisden Cricket Monthly, Phil Walker. Mark Butcher will be joining us over Zoom later in the episode. Um, let's start with the test squad. Uh, the return of test cricket is nearly upon us. We'll preview the series in a bit more depth over the next two weeks, and next week we've got a, a special episode looking back at the 2003 England-South Africa series, the one that saw NASA resign as England captain mid-series. Um, but this week, England have announced the 14-man squad. It's pretty much as expected. Ollie Robinson has been added to it after he took nine wickets on his return to action for Sussex last week. There's a Lions game against South Africa um, taking place before the first test. The squad will be announced later this week. Joe, if Robinson gets through that a game OK, would you expect him to come straight back into the team for that first test match? No, I think I'd be surprised if he plays that first test. He's just had three championship games all summer. Uh, albeit he did very well in the last one, taking nine wickets at Trent Bridge, as you said. Um, but I think I think they'll they'll stick with Broad, I think, for that first test of a series, see how he goes. If he struggles for wickets, as he has done a bit this summer, then I think Robinson is a, is a decent like-for-like replacement to come in for him. Um, but I think we'll probably see the bowling attack that that finished the last test, um, starting this one against South Africa, and I think that's that's the right way to go. You know, they've, England have done extremely well this summer. I don't think they'll be wanting to make changes that they don't have to. Uh, but it's an interesting point in Robinson's career he, after that brilliant start on the pitch and pretty horrendous start off it. Um, things have faded quite fast for him. He's obviously come under criticism for his fitness. He's had back injuries. Uh, there is still question marks about his attitude. Uh, and now it's over to him to show how much he he really wants it. I was a little bit surprised to see him come back in so quickly, given what's happened over the last few months and how much he struggled. Um, but I guess there aren't a huge amount of fast bowling options around still. We've got those fitness problems, uh, and whatever has happened over the last few months and in, in the Ashes, uh, Robinson did make a pretty spectacular start to his Test career and, and has shown that he is good enough for that level when everything's working. Mm. And I guess the thing with him having games to prove his fitness is there aren't any games to prove his fitness other than the Lions game and then actually playing for England because there are no championship games in August. Yeah, which is a hoary old subject which we can probably deal with another time. Uh, yeah, I, I know what you're saying, Joe, but th- that record does speak for itself. Big caveat, attitude fitness issues, sure. But what Stokes and McCullum are probably doing is firstly... Um, you know, fortifying their, their pace attack um, and giving themselves another option. But they're secondly saying to this bloke, if you want it, here's your chance. And they will look at it afresh and McCullum will meet him probably for the first time in a couple of weeks' time. And if they get the sense that he's not learnt a few home truths over the last six months regarding his his approach to to international cricket, which in fairness, he said himself, he's had to address and he gave a very interesting interview to to Vish for the Almanac which came out of course a couple of months ago where he acknowledged that himself so there's a self-awareness to Robinson whether that can translate to actually doing what's necessary to uh, honour his talent and his talent is there for all to see I mean he gets good players out um, we saw that in that Knotts game, right? Came back to, what, Hammy, Duckett and Joe Clark in yeah, his first clean, spell back. Clean them up in his first spell. And, and, and we, he, saw, we saw it in yeah. Australia on pitches that, you know, you wouldn't normally associate would work for a bowler who barely touches 80 mile an hour. Or if he does, he does it for an hour or two. And then he tends to fall, fall away a little bit. But he has that mercurial thing, that nip off the pitch, that which you saw in Australia. He got... Um, got worn out a couple of times with balls that jagged the way he gets good players out. So... His credentials 
across 22 yards are, are good. It's all the other stuff around him. Isn't that all that matters, though? <laughs> well, yes, up to a point. But if, yeah. you, if you are falling away after two days of a five-day game, and if you are constantly pulling up lame in the build-up to, up to, to test matches, um, then that, that's obviously problematic. Do, do you think the fitness stuff is possibly a bit overblown? Yeah. So in yeah. 2021, um, only Dan Worrell among seam bowlers bowled more overs in first-class cricket than Robinson. Uh, I mean, this season, he's had three separate things. He's had the tooth thing, he's had COVID, and then the back problems um and also like he did average 21 against the three best sides in the world and four of those test matches were in australia even on the day that john lewis criticized him he was england's best bowler that day so he got warner and smith out and lavishane dropped in this in the slips and england were a bowler down anyway because stokes couldn't bowl and obviously that was that you know that came at the end of a truly miserable tour um so i, I do wonder if like it is just slightly overblown like the fitness overblown problems or that. overblown or i've and I haven't got any proof on this, but mm. whether it's kind of slightly euphemistic, whether whether fitness means something slightly more than fitness, whether mm. it means a wholehearted determination to to be the best player you can possibly be. And there are quite a few stories after the Ashes that came out which suggest he wasn't as committed as he might have been. So I wonder it's not just getting through your overs in a day. I think it's I think it's a more mm. rounded thing than that. Um, you know, he's come to international cricket late. I think there is a fitness that you can there are different levels of fitness aren't there i think and and he can get through county spells bowling you know mid 70s and will still be an extremely dangerous bowler that's probably not going to be enough in test cricket so it's it's a different thing he's got to have to learn i would have been interested to see obviously jamie overton has missed out with injury it would have been interesting to see if robinson had been picked for this squad anyway whether he would have been picked above craig overton i think jamie overton would have been in that squad because mm. he offers that point of difference i'd have liked to see whether Robinson or Craig Overton are, are higher in that hierarchy and I guess we'll, that will become clear over the course of the South Africa series but there's no doubt Ollie Robinson has looked a much more threatening bowler than Craig Overton across their test careers so oh, absolutely. I think even yeah it's and, and Jamie more threatening than Craig as well you know yeah. Mike Selvey who, who knows bowlers inside out has said you know it's ironic that Craig's brother may have ended Craig's chances of a test career with just with that one game um, at also least. making the runs that we and, have expected from Craig and haven't really got yeah. as well yeah, 97 on debut, you, you take that. Um, the, the thing that's stark about this lineup is that they, uh, while there is obviously differences in quality from Anderson through to, you know, Potts and experience and so on, but they are all pretty much of a muchness. And, and it's just an unfortunate piece of timing. People could maybe be a bit murkier on that and question schedules and training regimes and whatever. But the reality is, whatever the reasons... Stone, Archer, Wood, and now Jamie Overton, the four quickest bowlers in England. Correct me if I'm forgetting one or two. You can add Mamou to that list as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah and who's also crocked. Yeah. All, all five of the quickest five bowlers in English cricket are all struggling to get on the park. Um, uh, on the one hand, that's bleak, and there are there are legitimate kind of question marks think, going into that three-match series, especially if, if the pitches do offer a little bit as... They have done here at the Oval, for example, you know, pace and bounce all year at the Oval. South Africa definitely have the edge in, in terms of, of bite and zip in their bowling attacks. But then on the other side of the, the argument is if you could get four or four of those five players fit and in good nick to play some four some five day cricket matches. There was a Freudian slip to play some five day cricket matches uh, at some point over the next year, building into next summer, obviously, when 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 the big boys turn up again. Then, then you look at the the stocks of English seam seam bowling cricket, and you think, yeah, there's there's plenty to work with there. Mm. I, I guess the reason why I'm, I, I I like Robinson coming straight back. I just think he did so well last yeah, year. Yeah, I did too. He's, he's basically he was England's best bowler last year. I think consistently. Anderson had his second innings problems. Broad wasn't quite as as effective as he was, and Potts was only four tests into his career. So I understand why they'd, they'd want him straight back in now he's available. And also he was he was so good against not. I think seven of his nine wickets were top four batters. Um, so he's taken more wickets in three games than any other Sussex bowler <laughs> this year. Yeah, which is sums up. Sums, how, yeah, sums Sussex. Sussex yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, we won't have the, the Zach Crawley debate again, but he's been retained in the squad. Uh, he had a couple more low scores for Kent this week, which means his first class average after eighty three games has dropped below thirty. Twenty two this year. Twenty two well. this year. I mean that. It says something that this isn't really a conversation topic. That a guy who's averaging twenty two, not in Test cricket and first class cricket this summer, hmm. is opening the batting for England. We're just sort of. You know that we, whether it should happen or not, is debatable. But we knew it was going to happen. Mm. So, and England have said, I, I think he'll. I wouldn't be surprised if he 
even if he fails the next four innings, I wouldn't be surprised if he plays that third test. But I, I wouldn't either. I think he plays, come what may, I think he plays the rest of the test match summer. Uh, and as I said at the start of the summer, knowing that this stuff will keep coming around and coming around, I'm all right with that personally. I'm all right with I it. I said we're not having the Zach Crawley debate. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he started it. Oh, Edward asked, when was the last time in England when was the last time England selected a specialist bat with a Red Bull average of under thirty? I think the answer's Gower. Um, unless there's someone since then. Because do you remember when we did the podcast with him a couple of years ago in lockdown one? I basically asked him quite early on why were you selected? Because mm. your record wasn't very good. Because mm, um, Raymond was rather fond of him. Yes, mm. yes. Yeah, I mean, Vaughan and Truscothic were, were not much over 30, but mm. they were. I think Truscothic was 32, so. Vaughan around that sort of, Yeah, it's, it's, it probably is Gower, I would say. Yeah. It probably is Gower. Um, we, we're going to go to Butch about the specifics of the T20i series, but Phil, what have you made of the, the month of men's white ball cricket that just raced by 12 games in, in 25 days? Obviously, we talked about why are these games... Field, but I just thought it was, it was just extremely hard to get into from a fan's point of view. Each series wasn't quite long enough for as soon as the narrative was developing, that was the end of that series, you need to be on to the next one. And it was quite hard to get your, your, your teeth stuck into. And when there's so much other sport going around and it's competitive to kind of fill column inches, etc., um, kind of I thought the English international summer kind of was uh left behind a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I was I was glued. <laughs> I was glued to it from start to finish. Obviously, it does struggle for context at the best of times. And while I understand why people get frustrated with the schedule and the relentlessness of it, and I can absolutely understand players saying, it's not just getting on the park, it's all the bits in between. It's the travel, it's, it's the, another night in a different hotel, it's the relentlessness of it that, that grinds you down. And I can absolutely understand and respect that. I do get that. Uh, and, if, and sure, if there was a, a week gap between the end of the India three match, whatever, and the start of the South African three match, whatever, then sure, there would be a bit of, there would be a gestation period and you can reflect a bit more and you can talk and you can eke some stories out and build a few stories up. I get that. But these are in the end functioning three match white ball bilateral series, which have been threatened forever uh, and squeezed forever and will continue to be ever more so over the next period of time. And they've always struggled for not context, but depth because they are good days out and they can be gripping undoubtedly and they can be thrilling undoubtedly in and of themselves at that moment. But are we really believing that if there was that significant buffer between the end of one and the start of another, we'd have a deeper and more resonant connection to these things really so you might as well just get them out of the way as quickly so we may as well just play them we, ideally it wouldn't be 12 over 25 days it would be 12 over 35 days mm. and we wouldn't be so 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 you know tied to the lunacy of, the, of this this schedule arguably I'd, I'd also add that you know i'm not going to pretend for a second i was utterly compelled by by the last month of white ball cricket but it's easy to be sniffed. joe's way of saying indifferent you know it's, it's, <laughs> he's very good at it. it's very good it's um you know as England white ball fans, we've got used to seeing our side win and play some pretty extraordinary kick cricket. And that didn't really happen over the last four weeks. And they've got some kind of headaches to solve, which, you know, it's quite an interesting place to be. And it's been quite predictable for white ball cricket for a while. But from South Africa's point of view, that, you know, they're not going to be dancing in the streets of Joburg or anything. But that, <laughs> but, but it, it, it was a, it was a significant win against a good side. Yeah. And as England centric supporters or podcasters or whatever it is, mm. We shouldn't just brush it aside and say, oh, that was just part of the summer. Thank God that's done. Or what happened to it? Just a big, big moment for South Africa, particularly in the context of world cricket, where, you know, the, the big three get much of the focus and the rest get forgotten. Yeah, it's a, it's a bang on point. And it has also served the purpose as it used to, albeit there is now a kind of a break for a couple of weeks until that first test match. But there is, there is that sense of it now bubbling up to the crescendo of the summer uh, as it used to be. And... It, the, the structure in the old days of white ball cricket building into red ball cricket was always uh, the best way for me as a fan. And, and you do now have that. South Africa have made their mark already, albeit there will be changes in personnel, but they've made their mark. They've indicated that they're here, um, that they're a serious cricket team. Um, and, and it does whet the appetite for sure going into, into the big stuff. Absolutely. Mm. 
And when England lost that T20 series to South Africa, here's what Mark Butcher thinks about that series. Um, Butch, instead of starting with England, let, let's talk about South Africa. They were really good. Ngili and Chamsey, brilliant with the ball. Ngili, slower balls. England batters didn't really have um, many answers um, to them. Miller and Stubbs as well, brilliant with the bat. Hendricks too. Are they, are they T20 World Cup contenders? Um, well, I reckon about four or five teams are, yeah. Uh, but they'd, they'd certainly be up there. They've, they've, they've um, bowling attack looks really, really sharp, and they've kind of, you know, even even without Quentin de Kock having a having much of an impact on the series, they managed to to be competitive in in two of the three games, haven't they? In fact, even the even the game they lost at Bristol, they uh, the margin wasn't as big as the two that England lost. Put it that way. So. Um, you know, they, they've got a way, I think, of, of managing or being able to put a total on the board that they've got a bowling attack to defend. Um, you know, that they haven't gone sort of massively gung-ho batting-wise. I mean, the fact that they've been able to leave out somebody as good as Rassi van der Dussen um, and still win that series gives you an idea that batting-wise, they, they've got quite a bit of depth. Um, and the, the bowling attack, I, I really like. You know, it's, it's the, particularly when you add Nokia to it. Nokia the other day was kind of like took things to a different level, I think, at, uh, at Southampton. Um, there will be some days, clearly, when, when obviously that, that raw pace, and some, some pitches maybe where that raw pace is not, uh, is not conducive or at least will offer batters a lot of scoring opportunities. But the very fact that he, was, he, he bowled a spell which looked likely to rip somebody's head off at some point and was, and was accurate with it. Um, gives them another dimension as well to go along with the, the obvious changes of pace, etc. So they look they look a really really good side. They look a solid team. Um, mm. Whether or not you know, and in the in the white hot light of a, of a knockout ICC tournament that stands up, you don't know. But um, at the moment, they don't look bad. Mm. Um, and just on Tristan Stubbs as well, he's one of three South Africans who've uh, been picked up by the Mumbai Indians before they've actually played for South Africa. And, and in Stubbs case, you can absolutely see why. I thought with both him and Miller bat- batting at the death, there was a there was a stark contrast between them and how England tried to bat aggressively. There was a lot more control to the way they were doing it. Um, just on just on Stubbs, um, absolutely phenomenal in that in that first game in particular. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, the, the guys guys coming in at, in the last five or six overs of a T Twenty game are extremely dangerous when when they've been given a platform to launch from, aren't they? Mm. Um, you know, Liam Livingston could do something very similar, but he was, he's been getting in at fifty for four, and that kind of that changes the game, changes the game on your ability to come and come out and uh, and swing. Um, yeah, it gives it gives South Africa an element, I think, with the pair of them there, that that perhaps has been lacking in their in their short form cricket for for a while. That sort of real brutality towards the back end of an innings. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, look. The interesting thing, I suppose, is, is less what they did in this series, but more what that says about the scouting capabilities of, of the IPL teams and the way in which, you know, given what, what's happened with the, with the South Africa tournament coming up, the way in which they are, they're taking over the world. <laughs> I mean, you know, they have the resource and they have the, um, the backing to kind of to, to do that sort of thing. And, and that's it, it stubs. Is not going to be the first. Who's, who's the other lad? Um, uh, Marco Janssen was the first one, and there was dual Brevis Janssen, as well. Brevis, yeah, Brevis was the other guy I was thinking of. So yeah, I mean, Marco Janssen didn't didn't make an appearance in the series as well. So they've got you know they've got a lot of um, a lot of high quality, high impact players, and of course, if you're going to win a T20 tournament, that's that's exactly what you need plenty of, and it, and it looks as though they've got. Uh, resources to burn in that in, in that regard. Yeah, and, and, and Temba Bavuma is their T20 captain and he wasn't around for this series, but given how Hendricks played, how Russo did when he came in and Stubbs is emerging as well, that is a really hard batting lineup for him to break into. Well, yeah, I mean, his so at the beginning of the series, the two guys, if Temba had been here, the two guys who kind of stood out in, in um, South Africa's batting resources as being um, less than optimal, I suppose, in terms of their strike rates were Bavuma and Hendricks. Um, you know, Hendricks has, has just made three back-to-back 50s at a, at a rate much higher than his, than his average over the course of, you know, quite a large sample size now. Um, and so perhaps, you know, he's, he's sort of turned a corner or has the confidence to go out there and play at a, at a slightly higher tempo. Um, but South Africa didn't miss Bavuma at all um, in the series. And I suppose 
on a personal level for him that's a, that's that could be a bit of a worry but on a on a on a, on the level of you know south africa's chances in the tournament it doesn't seem to have done them any harm so there's one for uh, for Boucher and Smith and Co to, to mull over. Mm. And then in England, they were they were really flat. We talked about that before on the show, but in that last T20 in particular, they were completely completely thumped and didn't. Re- you know, there are lots of lots of players in that side are well well short of their best at the moment. I know the bowling attack is still short of a lot of first choice players, but with the bat, they they are miles off at the moment. Yeah, they looked a long long way off. And you know, I, I interviewed. Matthew Mott at the end of the game and he didn't duck any of the, the hard questions. Um, you know, the schedule is partly to blame. I mean, the, the idea of having to of, of sort of how many games they play? They played 12 white ball games in the course of 25 days, I think. Course of June. Yeah. Um, plus the three in, in Amsterdam plus the, the test matches that were played as well. I mean, it was, it was kind of, it was kind of mad um, and not ideal at all. However, um, you know you can't help you can't help but notice that there's a there's a difference in atmosphere. There's at least there's a difference in kind of um, in the way. Put it this way: Owen Morgan's Owen Morgan's demeanour didn't change at all, whether he was, whether it was good or whether it was bad. And looking at the the team on the balcony at Cardiff, I think it was after you know they, they imploded in that run chase down there, you kind of, you know, guys sat on the balcony like rabbit rabbits in headlights, sort of everybody showing emotionally what, what was going on inside the dressing room. And that kind of was, it was a really different look for, um, for an England white ball team. You know, good or bad, you'd normally see them sort of joking around and sort of sitting and sitting close to one another, chatting. It was guys sitting on their own, staring blankly into the distance. It kind of looked like, a, <laughs> like something out of a nightmare from the 90s. Um, and that's something they're going to need to get get a get a handle on pretty quickly because it's it's all very well you know if you they still they still have the same um, mantra in terms of we back each other and we go out there and we look to be positive and there's no recriminations but it doesn't look like it doesn't look like that that's trans translating into what's actually happening um, and the sort of that enjoyment and togetherness that that that, that has always been displayed mm. with Morgan at the helm. Seems to have vanished over the course of over the course of the, some some tricky and tough losses. Um, it's very very difficult, isn't it, to build up sort of that aura of invincibility, um, and it takes a while to do. And England sort of had it, but but clearly with these things, it doesn't take very long to kind of dismantle it, and that will give a lot of other teams, um, you know, some real. Uh, well, it, it just makes it it, ma- it makes England less fearsome to face, I guess. I think that's mm. the uh, the interesting thing. So they've got to get hold of that pretty quickly. Um, you know, the stuff with the bowlers being out and all that, I mean, that's, that's been the case for a very long time now. Um, and so, you know, leading into the T20 World Cup, all of these games for the guys that were playing were kind of, were proper dress, have been proper dress rehearsals and all the ones going forward will be as well. Because I don't think that you can rely on the fact that, you know, I don't think we're going to see Archer in the, the World T20. I don't think we're going to see Wood. Um, Chris Wokes is maybe a little bit closer, but time is running out for him as well. So you've almost got to say to yourself, well, this is, this is what we got. So there's no point worrying about what's not what's not here. What are we going to do with what is? Um, and and at the moment, they've got time. You know, there there are there's the the tour of uh, Pakistan. Um, there are matches in Australia, etc. But the you know for the moment, you've got to look at it that these are all very much dress rehearsals, and isn't, and it isn't a case of we're just waiting for for our bigger players to come back. Mm. I guess also from a tactical point of view, I think your 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 colleague Owen on the Sky commentary said that when he was captain, he quite liked having a side that batted quite deep, and that is a tactical thing that has changed. England are, England are basically packing the side with with one extra bowling option compared to when he was when Morgan was captain. Moe and Ali bowled really well in the five overs that he did bowl in the series. But he only bowled five overs. England were especially match up dependent with Moe. Um, yeah, perhaps and, probably going too and, too close to the matchup stuff, and also Moeen Ali has done really well for England recently, but he has been trusted more with the bat than he had been under Morgan's captaincy, certainly the last couple of years of it. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we a lot of the um, a lot of the, the wonder kids with the computers that have, have been sort of have been sort of talking about matchups and, and saying, you know, this this decision was wrong because X Y Z on the uh, you know on the spreadsheet says that this is what you should do, but. When it comes down to it, well, basically the, the, the basic premise of, of having your, your highest impact or your best players kind of in there in the mix, or the guys who are bowling best at the time in there in the mix, in the game, um, 
uh, more often than not is is just is more successful you know mm-hmm. every once i think owen was was very keen to to make sure that he was he was up to date on all the matchup stuff but quite often he would ignore the matchup in order to go with something that was working at the time so i think you know you have to with all of these things there's merit in all of it but but none of it is is the is the definitive way forward you have to you have to sort of pick your way through the minefield of all that information and sometimes go with what's what's playing in front of your face um you know Mo, Mo bowled one over five didn't he and the, it, he, he got it he dismissed his match up he wasn't seen again now rash over the course of, of, of all of the one day games so far has been going at, going at way above his normal economy rate isn't hasn't been picking up wickets um, and yet he was entrusted more with Moeen. And yet Moeen had been, you know, Moeen over the course of all of these white ball games had, had proven to, um, you know, had proven to be more, uh, at least more dangerous in terms of taking wickets. And, you know, if you look at the scores that South Africa made, the winning scores that they made, they, the England, England's problem was not that they, were, that they were getting hammered through the middle part of the innings. It wasn't that. It was the fact that they couldn't get anybody out. And therefore, when it came to the death, could do very little to stop them. Mm. Um, and again, if you go back to the you know the, the, the winning ways or the mantras of somebody like Morgan, it's take wickets at, at all costs. Take wickets. Mm. Um, so there we go. I mean, look, it's it, it feels a little bit like doom and gloom because the, the the contrast has been so stark. And again, I put it to Matthew Moore in the um, in that post match interview. I said, look, you know, the people people here they were they were shouting bring back Morgan. They were they were shouting rubbish. People were leaving the stadium early at, down down there at Southampton. Um, you know, it really was a, a return to sort of like the bad old days. And I guess people have been spoiled over the course of a long period of time and hadn't, hadn't seen England um, perform in that, in that manner. However, and, and this is something, again, that I sort of warned about a long, long time ago when the, the, the split coaches thing was, was, uh, was, was talked about, was that on the one hand, you feel as though you've got the, you know, you, the, all of the attention and, and the sparkling great saviour is over there to look after one team and the other team has been left to its own devices. Now, of course, that's unbelievably simplistic, but it doesn't take many bad results and bad performances for that to embed itself into the thinking of, um, you know, into the thinking perhaps not, if not the players, then maybe the people watching the game. If, and if that then translates itself, that pressure then passes itself onto the dressing room, you find yourself in a situation where it becomes very difficult to, to break out of that. Um, and that's uh, we're, we're in, in dangerously close territory to that happening, particularly judging by the the, res- the reaction from the crowd the other yeah. day. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess with that, I think people haven't actually quite realised that England's record in white ball cricket since the 2019 World Cup under Morgan wasn't actually that good. Like at the end of the day, they lost against an okay New Zealand side in the T20 World Cup. There have been bilateral series defeat. They lost a game against Ireland, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, just finally, Butch, though, uh, the hundred starts today. Um, it is short of a couple of its star names in Ben Stokes and Johnny Besto opting not to play in it. Obviously, those two guys play a lot of cricket and need a rest. But what are your, what are your general thoughts on that? Um, it's it's red meat to the to the people who hate the hundred. Um, you know the, the gleeful responses to that, and I I, I completely understand that. Um, it's entirely logical that that the guys with the test match series to prepare for would, would, would remove themselves from the, from the tournament. Um, and again, with, with the 100 in general, because, because of the, the, the way, it, where it is in, in the, in the inter, where it is in the calendar, because of the relatively small amounts of money that, that the biggest stars are getting paid to be in it, I think it's one of the first things that players look at and go, if I am, if I am a little bit tired and if I am um, in need of a bit of a break, then that's the one that I'm going to, I'm going to miss. Um, you know, the, the, the format is not something that gets played anywhere else. The money isn't startling. And, you know, I'm sorry, sorry to bring up the cash to, um, you know, to, to, to fans of the game, but the players are looking at it in that, in that, in that way, you know, they've never had, they've never had the choices that they've had, um, that they have at the moment at any point in the, in the history of the game. And, um, you know, they, they're weighing up, looking after their bodies with, with, with cushioning their bank balances for retirement. Mm. And at the moment, the 100 kind of does, it does not, it, well, it doesn't do any of the things really. It doesn't, it doesn't really put you in, it, some, the England players, it puts some of the ones who are not in the England team in the shop window. There's no doubt about that. But for, in, for international player, current international players, it's probably not that big a draw card. 
Um, and that's, you know, and that's something that it will have to come to term with, terms with over the, over the next few years in, in, in terms of how it, how it becomes something that people, that players don't want to miss. Mm. Um, and um, it certainly isn't there at the moment. Yeah, I guess, I guess England are lucky at the moment in a way that there are very few cross-format players so that Bairstow and Stokes are actually, you've got Archer and Wood injured, etc. But there aren't actually that many guys who would be playing all formats at the moment. So that, that comes, yeah, that helps them in a way that there aren't too many people who are going to do what you say and pull out the 100. No, and, and you know, and if, and if next year's schedule or the schedule after resembles in any way this one, then there will there'll be even fewer Um you know, it's it's a it's a real mess. I know there's a review coming up. Read something very interesting yesterday about um, potential for sort of like a 12-team Division One championship, um, and then you know the the other six teams augmented by four of the best minor county sides to, to play in Division Two. I mean, there's lots there's lots of wild wild things knocking around in terms of what might be coming. Um, it's uh, it, it, at the moment. It really does feel like it's sort of crossroads for the sport. Um, and the bizarre thing is, is that it has, um, in in its traditional formats, I suppose, in the, in the, the fifty over game and in the and in the uh, the twenty over game and in the test match arena, it seems as though everything everything is fine. You know, the <laughs> it's just when you add it, you throw in the um, you throw in franchise teams or you throw in money from outside of the traditional sources, competitions from outside the ICC's control. And then suddenly, um, you know, suddenly the whole thing goes crazy because the players are in control of all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the, uh, the, the, the powers that be have had this coming for a very, very long time simply because they did not, they did not foresee um, that not allowing your boards from countries that were not blessed with the wealth of, of England, Australia and India, not, allowing those boards or giving those boards the resources to be able to pay their players enough to make international cricket their priority. You know, they've allowed this, this, other, this other beast to grow, grow into something that is now almost uncontrollable. Um, and uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be utterly fascinating what happens in the next six months, maybe to a year, um, as to what happens and, and what, our, and what our, count, our game at home looks like. You know, that's something for the ECB to, to sort out, Rob Key and Strauss and all the rest of it. Um, you know, that the, there's, there's been a whole unholy mess made around the schedule. And now something, something very, very drastic is needed to try and sort it out. When I don't think that, that the moves needed to, that, that needed to be made in the first place were as drastic as the ones we're going to have to use to fix them. Mm. Um, so that's on, that's on a home level. And then internationally, it looks as though anything goes from now. These, these next two World Cups... You might want to enjoy them because they might. <laughs> we, we might not see anything look like them ever again beyond um, the twenty three fifty over World Cup and this next T Twenty World. Cup. In in terms of players choosing, picking and choosing what they're going to play. I mean, the big big news from Australia this week is that David Warner, David Warner might um, not play in the BBL, and he, instead of playing that, he plays the new T Twenty tournament in the U in the UAE. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Players opting to do stuff that isn't run by their own board? Yeah, absolutely. And and you know the the big bash the big bash falls under a similar sort of category to the hundred in terms of, um, in terms of finance, I suppose. Now the big bash was held up here for for many years as being sort of like the sort of model that we ought to have gone down. You know, it's it's brilliant and the kids are all there and it's on at a great time in, in, in the morning for us in the winters and all that kind of stuff. But the big bash got lost, lost its way. It got it got greedy. It went for more more teams. It went for more games, and it became something that was kind of, you know, it became unloved very very quickly. Um, and now and and also it was something that didn't pay as much money as as you know. Obviously, the IPL is the is is the most important one. But when when these competitions start to stretch out into being a month, month and a half, six weeks, seven, eight, eight weeks, if if the remuneration does not match that length of time commitment for the players then the players will go somewhere where they can be there for, for a shorter period of time or if the time is the same for money that is beyond your wildest dreams mm. um, and that's you know none of that is rocket science is it you, you, everybody understands how that works um, and so it doesn't surprise me at all if, if Warner if, if the South African League backed by the Indian cash 
um, you know, wants to throw a huge amount of money his way, then he'll go. I mean, I, I don't see, I don't see, there's no conflict there, not as far as he's concerned. Mm -hmm. He doesn't owe the, um, the Australian cricket board anything now, I suppose. Oh, well, that's how he'll see it. Um, and then it's up to the, then it's up to the ACB. Is they still called the ACB? Uh, then it's up Pretty to them Australia. to kind of, yeah. It's, it's up, then it's up to them to kind of come up with, a, to come up with a, a, something to keep their players on side. You see, they, they've never had to worry about this before because, again, when it comes to playing, representing Australia, the players have always been unbelievably well looked after, as the English ones are. But it's but that suddenly that he has he now has a choice whether to do something in Australian cricket for the Big Bash or do something somewhere else for himself. Um, and at his time of his career, he's going to choose the latter, I would imagine. Hmm. I feel like quite a lot of our conversations don't end in the most upbeat manner. But um, cheers for okay, your time come on, as always. Let, no, let, no, let's try. Let's try and find something good. You know, <laughs> <laughs> let's try and. Say, um, I, I'll tell you what I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to. Um, I'm looking forward to a Test match series that. Uh, that is a little way away, you know, with the, how, how about this, you know, the idea that given the chance to sort of salivate a little bit, think about what might be coming, um, you know, without it feeling like you're just moving from, from one day to the next where it doesn't feel particularly special. I think that this Test match series has got the, got the potential, um, obviously with it, you know, England's exploits early in the summer, but a South African team that I think are going to be very, very sharp, uh, I think it has a potential to be a beauty. So let's, let's finish and, and ruminate on the idea that there's a bit of room to play mm. with before we can uh, <laughs> before we move on to the next bit of international cricket. Absolutely, that that's that's South Africa attack against the, that England batting on up and the way England are batting at the moment is going to be absolutely fascinating. Um, anyway, cheers for your time, Butch. Um, enjoy the rest of your break and see you soon. The hundred starts today. It's not quite the same as last year in that the men's competition starts before the women's one does, as the Commonwealth Games are still going on. Uh, I think it's fair to say from the reaction on social media that a lot of people who didn't like the 100 last year still don't like the 100. Not many people changing <laughs> their mind on this, are they? Uh, we're going to do a two years of the 100 thing on the podcast at the end of the tournament, looking back uh, on its impact on, uh, on play well. players' careers, but also the counter game as well. Um, it's going to be it's going to be balanced. Um, on the tournament itself, let's have some predictions, please. Uh, Joe, first a men's tournament. Um, your predicted winner, then a, a breakout star, I guess. Um, so I, I like the look of Birmingham Phoenix, who lost the final last year. Livingston, Moen, Benny Howe, Will Smead, Adam Milne. And they've got the Aussie Matt Wade, obviously was a hero of the T20 World Cup win, who's joined them. But I'm going for Manchester Originals, who look really strong to me. Going to have Joss Butler available for the whole tournament. Phil Salt, Andre Russell... Matt Parkinson, and crucially, uh, Winindu Hasaranga, the Sri Lankan leg spinning all-rounder, who is you know, about, about as good a player as there is in T20 cricket these days, can have that sort of similar effect to Rashid Khan and that he just won't go for many of his four overs. Uh, and he's potentially a more destructive bat batter than Rashid Khan, potentially. Um, so I think they, they've got like a nice balance. Having two gun leg spinners in your side goes a long way to winning T20 matches. So I think they'll be very hard to beat. Oh, you wanted a player to watch as yep, well. Yeah, go for it. Uh, we talked about him a bit on the pod, but I think we're going to talk about him quite a lot in the months and, and years ahead. Uh, Rian Ahmed, the Leicestershire leg spinner. He's the new pod favourite. Well, I think he might be, you know. Yeah. He's got all the ingredients. Um, he he is... plays that Parkinson lad. Whatever he's, called. <laughs> yeah. um, he's playing for Southern Brave, who won it last year. Uh, he had a really good blast, 19 wickets in the blast. Uh, played for England Lions recently. Still only 17 years old, uh, and he's a different style of leggy to Parkinson, and he's he's got an absolute ripper of a googly. That's his kind of trademark delivery. You can have a trademark delivery at 17. I don't know. Um, <laughs> bowls quite quickly as well. Bowls quite quickly. Yeah, a lot lot more fizz on it than Parkinson, but almost kind of the opposite style of leg spinner to Parkinson, mm. uh, really. Um, and you know, he's got an interesting little backstory. He actually came through at Knotts and then went to Leicestershire, which is obviously not the way you it's would the way expect around. it to go. <laughs> And crucially, Leicestershire got him to sign a new contract a couple of months ago, keeping him there until 2026, uh, which is massive because there would have been clubs hovering, mm. ready to grab him. Um, but he's obviously loyal to that club. And uh, I'm really excited to see how he goes in the 100. I, I think he will... Southern Brave have got a really good side. I'm not saying he'll play every game, but I think he'll play most. Uh, and I reckon he'll go really well. Mm. Uh, Oval Invincibles, yes. For me, say what you see. Yet again, myopic, can't see past the tip of my nose. However, 
just listen to this lineup, Joe. Uh, Sam Curran's your central contracted player. He'll play the whole tournament. Rory Burns, admittedly, might not play at all, but whatever. He's, he's been he's been asked to play, or well, he has chosen to play Royal London One. Has he? Yeah. There we go. Okay. So Sam Sam Curran, Jason Roy, Will Jacks is your top three. Sonu Narayan is in the side. Sam Billings is in the side. And Riley Russo is in the side. That's a serious top that is six. A serious You've top still six. got that is, dare I say it, a top six that any person who likes cricket should want to watch. Dare I say it. Then, we, we're, then with with the oh, by the way, and on the bench as well, they've got some good players. You know, if, in terms of injuries, if, if if it happens, Jordan Cox could come in. Jack Haynes is their kind of wild card kid. Nice. He's just come in. He's a good young player as well. But with the ball as well, uh, they've got Reese Topley obviously to kick off. Sam Curran can do a job. Obviously, again, Sonny Ryan does a job. But Nathan Souter is a very good white ball uh, leggy and. My tip for a kind of breakthrough quick is Mohammed Has name Has name Has name Yeah Has name Rather, uh, who was drafted into the War- the Worcestershire side earlier this year and did really well. And I've seen him training here. He sorted out his action. There was a bit of a kink in the in the elbow. It looks absolutely fine to me, albeit from a distance. He was bowling fast in the nets and against good players, Jacks, Roy, etc. They were just getting back on on their toes and just blocking him out to extra cover at best. So. I fancy that he'll go well. Uh, he's already got a very good record for Pakistan. He's only 22, 23 years old. And that kind of pace through the air is all the more valuable in this kind of cricket. So I fancy him. Oh, sorry, I feel like it's cheating going for an international cricket as your breakout star. Really? Yeah, I think Why? so. Why? Well, because they've already it's broken out. international game, They've mate. already broken out. Yeah, but I mean, how many people <laughs> know about Mohammed Hussain, right? Don't be, so, don't be so parochial. All right, I'll find someone else in the next couple of minutes. But anyway, I've put literal money... On Riley Russo, uh, Dan Lawrence, all right, it's a romance bet. He's obviously going to bum out. Um, Quinton de Kock, which is a mistake because he's not playing the whole tournament. Only just found that out this morning. Shocker. Uh, Adam Rossington at 66 to 1. I put a couple of quid on him, who will open the batting probably for London Spirit. To be top run scorer in the whole tournament. Yeah, and look, it's 66 to 1, Fine. Joe. Fine. Fine. I hope, I'm just put, hoping you haven't put much on it. I've put three, three pounds on <laughs> it. Three Fine. quid. Uh, and David Milan as well at, at 16s, and I, I genuinely fancy he he could he could mm. really bother it right at the top because he's a consistent run scorer. But yeah, over invincibles, and I just want to say in brackets, and I whisper it going through while while the tournament struggles desperately for heft and respect, and the loss of Stokes compounded by the the news of Besto pulling out as well. Uh, nonetheless. When you go through those squads, there's a lot of very, very watchable, very exciting mm. cricketers some in there. Some very good sides. Mm. Yeah. Some very good sides. Um, I am with Joe. I think I'm going for Manchester Originals. So, um, so Butler plays the whole tournament. Yeah, you? So but- Butler, Russell, Hasaranga. Um, and then if you just go through the list of players they have elsewhere, Evans, Salt, Matt Parkinson, Sean Abbott, Tom Lamanby. Uh, Fred Clarkson's a good death bowler. Wayne Madsen, Calvin Harris is a good leg spinner if they if they need another one. Richard Gleeson as well as their domestic wild card. So yeah, that's a good uh, side. It's a very very strong squad. Um, Southern Brave, I think who won it last year. I think they're still really good. But two of their bowlers who were really good last year haven't had great summers in Tamar Mills and George Garton. Um, th- those two guys were really important last year. And so. the two central contract slots are null and void. Obviously, yeah. it's Joffre and and they don't have they don't have yeah. a second. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think they're going to go quite as well. And also, uh, there's a lot resting on on Rah- Rahan Ahmed as well, who is just 17. And Jake Linter, um, also in the Southern Bray squad, wrote a column for Cook Info where he kind of warned he is only 17. Have a, have some patience. So Any um, team captained by James Vince tends to do pretty well these days, true. though. That is true. Um, and for breakout player, I'm going to go George Scrimshaw at Welsh Fire, who, who's kind of built a reputation for himself as, as a bit of a death specialist. I guess he's very tall. Um, he was at Worcestershire initially. Now at Derbyshire, he's spent a lot of time out injured. Did really well in the blast. Got an England Lions call up, and it's the there aren't that many death specialists in England. Um, and if he has a good tournament, you, you never know um, how quickly he could rise the ranks um, there. And then let's go to the women's tournament. I'm going for Southern Brave. Just looking their side, they can field a side with 11 internationals. I think Wyatt, Mandana, Bunkley, Shrub, Dunkley, Shrubsole, Wellington, McGraw. Bouchier, Bell, Tara Norris, Molly Strano, and Freya Kemp. So if you've got 11 internationals, you're probably, probably doing okay. Certainly, certainly a good start, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, I was very close to going for a Manchester Originals double. Uh, they've got Eccleston, Lazelle Lee, Deandra Dotton, Kate Cross. 
but I think Trent Rockets, who actually finished one from bottom last year, looked to me to have the strongest squad or the strongest players rather than perhaps the strongest squad. Uh, got Meg Lanning, which is a tidy start. Then you've got the power couple, Nat, Nat Stiver, Catherine Brunt. And then <laughs> nice. you've got uh, two, another cyber two-gun leggy, Sarah Glenn, England mm. leggy. And then Alana King, the Australian, who's made brilliant starts for her international career. Mm. See, big part of their World Cup win. Uh, I think even if the rest of the side isn't quite as strong, I think those five could carry pretty much any team. So I, I'm, for them. I'm leaning, good case by the way, but I'm leaning to Southern Brave in the women's uh, comp. And I think we, we all think that Freya Kemp, Kemp's going to be a breakout star. Obviously, she's now playing for England in the Commonwealth Games, but she's not played that much televised cricket before, if at all. I think we said last week's show, she was injured for last year's tournament. Yeah. Only 17, already doing really well for England. So I think that's quite an easy option um, there. A couple of... A couple of girls to pick out from the Birmingham Phoenix setup. Uh, Eve Jones has been doing really good work uh, here at the Oval. She's been scoring runs for fun um, in domestic cricket. Uh, and Emily Arlett as well, who we saw last year in the Rachel Hayhoe, um, took a hat-trick. And she looks like a very good young bowler. She's not quite at that kind of international level yet, but... Uh, she's a good one to watch as well. Excellent action, strong, strapping, kind of young, quick. So those two together uh, at, the, at the Phoenix are, are well worth a watch, I would say, if you're looking at those kind of players bubbling underneath mm. England's setup. Um, before we move on, let's talk about beer. Uh, to celebrate International Beer Day this Friday, the Wisden Shop is offering 20% off all Wisden Ale products until Sunday with a coupon code CHEERS20. A Wisden Tankard worth £14.99 will be included for free for the first 50 people that take advantage of the offer. Uh, strictly for over 18s only, please enjoy responsibly. Dan asks, did England pick the wrong Ollie Robinson? The Royal <laughs> London One Day Cup started yesterday and the highlight by far was Kent's Ollie Robinson scoring a double hundred as Kent chased down 350 with ease against Worcestershire. Uh, 206 not out off 131 balls. He joins an exclusive club of people to score list day double hundreds he is the fifth Englishman to do it can Ravi. you name the other four Ali Brown times two. Oh, I thought I thought you'd get one of one of the other ones definitely and the other one's a bit roger not coming to me uh, you've got Ben Duckett against Sri Lanka A oh, in 2016 yeah, yeah. Uh, and then Vince Wells against Berkshire in 1996 how did you not get that one <laughs> well blow me <laughs> How about that? Um, elsewhere in the Royal London One Day Cup, uh, Kashi Valley, the South Asian Cricket Academy graduate, scored 100 on his list day debut for Worcestershire, continuing his fine start to his professional career. My, my, my non-moment of the week, moment of the week, by the way, was in the in, in the previous games when the minor counties or the national counties, yes. as we call them now, were playing the first class counties. And my mate, Dazza, Darren Batch, strummed a 70-odd uh, against Kent for Did Suffolk, he? opening the batting. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Caught on the boundary as well. Batchy was his, his elder brother, Batchy, my best mate. He was there, and uh, Dazza was caught on the boundary apparently, going for another big one. Uh, but he took Nathan Gilchrist apart, facing up against a new ball. We're going to be talking about someone you've played cricket with slash against later in the show. Okay, um, looking forward to that. Um, Alex asks, "Is it really fair that there are zero days of county championship cricket played in August, and is this just the way it has to be to fit in the hundred?" According to BBC Sport, this is the first year where domestic first class cricket hasn't been played in England in August since 1939. I'm not sure that's definitely right because they probably didn't play during the war, but yeah, can't be far off. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just the way it is, isn't it? It's been it's been the case for, it's just going to be the case for quite a long time now. And also we have had quite a bit of midsummer cricket, if that makes, better than years gone by, is pre-100 it, years. Yeah, the, the, the fact that we're talking about August specifically makes mm. it look worse. It's actually slightly better than it was last year uh, in terms of having a bit more championship cricket in the in the middle of summer. I don't know what else to say about this, really. It, it's, you know, it's not right. Uh, but it's, it's okay. It's, <laughs> it's frustrating, but it is what it is. And the 100 not going anywhere, whether you like it or not. And this is what it's going to be like, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you literally can't summon the energy to get no, from one it's side just of because, to the well, other. Just I understand we, we, entirely where you're coming from. Personally, I would like to see Championship Cricket played every week of my life until I die. But... <laughs> That's not I, true. <laughs> I'm, okay, I'm okay. No, it is true. I love it. It's my favourite sports tournament in the whole of the world. It truly is. Um, but I'm okay with it, right? I'm okay with it. We've had a little sprinkling of it. It was a nice little shot in the arm in midsummer that we didn't have last year. 
I can cope with three weeks of, of, of no Red Bull first class cricket before it rolls into what's going to be a fascinating finale in September. Personally, we, I'm okay with if it. If we accept, however grudgingly, that the 100 is not going anywhere, the alternative is to play some championship cricket alongside the 100 and have all those players missing. And I think that is a worse scenario than the scenario we currently find ourselves in. Mm. Um, and also, I think it's, it's worth remembering that uh, players want to play these competitions as much as possible in bursts. And we got a little burst of county championship action. I think it's better than just having like random rounds in dispersed yeah. over, over Can the I summer. just briefly add, unrelated, but kind of related. Um, last year, the One Day Cup existed on the undercard um, and shamefully the final was on a Thursday in a less than half full Trent Bridge. Well, mm. thankfully at least it's rightfully been restored to a Saturday in mid-September, just after the end of the Test Series, just before the finale of the Championship Series. That is exactly, Championship Series, the Championship exactly where it should be and hopefully that showpiece which takes place two weeks after the semi-finals as well by the way so it won't be too condensed as it was again last year that will that will maybe give a little bit more um vibrancy i suppose and a bit more kind of credibility to it to a tournament that deserves more support than it got last year mm, there's no cricket on that day i think apart from that no there is no no anyway moving on the the front runners for the county championship are even more established than they were before uh, the, the latest round of fixtures. The top three of Surrey, Hampshire and Lancashire all won. Surrey now lead by 16 points, but I would argue that Hampshire have the better run in. Surrey have North Ants actually on a pretty decent run, then Lancashire and Yorkshire. Hampshire have North Ants, Kent and Warwickshire all sides in the bottom half of the table. Such a shame they're not playing each other. I know Joey was kicking yeah. off on this. <laughs> Don't get me but, started, Phil. Oh, <laughs> but yeah, it, it is it is a, a great shame. But look, it's going to go all the way down to the wire. I think it's a, mm. it's a good shout actually Joe's famously put a few few quid down on on Hampshire at the start of the year, mm. and I think I think he's going to be well in the mix. Mm. Um, is, is there a chance of Lanks creeping through? I mean, technically yeah. they are still in the scrap, and obviously, as you say, they do play Surrey, so they would need Surrey and or Hampshire to lose twice, I think, to right. get back yeah. in it. Which, okay. based on the season so far, feels a stretch, but you know, not not impossible. Yeah, they're definitely not out of it. Um, Joe, what is your moment of the week? Uh, well, mine was actually a Hampshire win but I'm focusing this time on on the side that lost which was Yorkshire uh fell to a seven wicket defeat to Hans at Scarborough there's so much go stuff going off the field at Yorkshire that I think actually uh some stuff that's going on the field has slipped under the radar we haven't talked about them that much on the on the pod this summer really I would say um so Yorkshire haven't won a championship game since the first round of games in mid-April they've not won a home game all season um there are some mitigating circumstances. Matt Fisher, I think, has played one game. Ben Code, who just piles up the wickets, usually hasn't been fit as well. But things aren't going well. And it, I think it would have got much more focus if it wasn't for the other stuff, which puts the on-field stuff in, in the shade a little bit. But Steve Patterson, their captain, resigned after the defeat to Hampshire, uh, having been told that he wasn't going to be kept on next year. So he stood down. Uh, Johnny Tattersall, their kind of homegrown keeper, has come in as captain. Uh, he's had a really good season, Tattersall, but he, he wasn't in their side not so long ago. He, he wasn't even at the club. They released him a few years prior to that. He's not a player that you would have said he's going to be next Yorkshire captain. I think that's kind of symptomatic of, of where they find themselves. Um, it's really been the, the bowling where they've that they've struggled. Obviously, I mentioned they've ha had two key players missing, but they just haven't been able to take wickets. They've drawn, I think, six of their 10 games. They've only lost three times, which isn't, you know, isn't, isn't too bad. But if you're not getting any wins, then you're going to, going to struggle and actually looking at the fixtures that are remaining I thought they were safe but they've got four games left uh the next three Lancashire at Old Trafford Essex at home Surrey at the Oval uh they are only 17 points ahead of Somerset in ninth so you know they probably will be safe but but they're not there yet their final game is at uh against Gloucestershire at Headingley I think um which they might need to win or at least get something from going into the final round of the season if the form book continues in their next three games. So, you know, Yorkshire have had, had, a, had a lot going on, but if they end up going down this season, that, you know, it, it's not like losing your Premier League status in terms of the finances involved, but it in terms of unrest amongst the fans, what the players will think, who they'll be able to attract to the club, it could have a really big effect if, if that was to play out. Um, they have a bit, good bit of news for them last week. They've signed Matt Milnes, the Kent fast bowler, on a three-year deal. Kent really um, not happy to lose him. 
But I think Milne said specifically he was looking forward to working with Otis Gibson, who's obviously head coach at Yorkshire, been England fast bowling coach in the past, thinks that's someone who can really help his game kick on. So that's that's a positive bit of news. But there's not been much in terms of Red Bull cricket for Yorkshire this this summer. Um, and I think it's an interesting story to, to watch over the next, well, not the next month, because nothing's happening for the next month. But, <laughs> but, but after that, in over September. Cut, Joe, 50 over the cut. month after that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and another, so it's kind of a subplot to this. Yeah. Uh, Gary Balance has been conspicuous by his absence all summer. Um, he is still coming to terms with the, the what's happened in the fallout from the Azim Rafiq stuff, which obviously he was very much um, caught up in. Accusations were leveled at him, which he subsequently admitted. Um, he has come back in second eleven cricket. He made back to back hundred in second eleven games recently. Then he played in a one day warm up game, made ninety five from twenty five balls uh, against what? Northumberland. Twenty five, uh, eleven sixes in twenty five balls. Uh, seemingly kind of ready to play in the one day cup. Then he didn't play yesterday in Yorkshire's first game. Now I, I got in touch with Yorkshire to ask, was he available for that game, and is he expected to play in the competition? I haven't. Had a, had a reply from that but you'd assume if he's playing in that game then that is the direction we're moving in um, but we'll have to see what future he, he has at the club they've stayed faithful to him mm. which is given, reasonably controversial given the fact that they sacked pretty much everyone else involved um, you could say he owes Yorkshire really mm. and uh, we'll see if he comes back in the next couple of weeks mm. what a story to be told if anybody could really get journalistically if they get their teeth into it the story of this summer for Yorkshire mm. and if they do manage to stay up and they probably will then it's one for you Joe that's all I'm saying just, <laughs> just, just get your teeth into it mate you're, 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 the, you're the ultimate suave diplomat right you'll be able to to tell the story across all all 17 sides of this of this tale oh, as, yours, we, as we've yours. seen in, in recent years they're not the most forthcoming when it comes to <laughs> no. journalists approaching them for interviews <laughs> no. but we'll no. we'll see how that goes Veering towards a blackout and i just want to briefly say i know i know no. north ants right you know in in football where a team finishes sort of fourth or fifth out of nowhere and yet the team that wins the league the manager is always the manager of the year mm. north ants should be the team of the year if they if if the form plays out and they finish fourth or fifth, and they're currently in fifth, they're 31 points up from Somerset in ninth. So you'd think that they're safe, uh, barring a catastrophe. Well, and also crucially, game in hand on seventh. And yeah, sorry, well. yeah. So, yeah. They've got four to play. They've just played 10, exactly that. But really, really good what they've done this year. They missed out on the quarters of the T20 by a point, but they brought in Chris Lynn. They paired him up with Jimmy Neesham, but they brought in Ryan, Ryan Rickleton as well. And this is nerd stuff, but... You know, he's a really good cricketer with a brilliant record and he's come in, hit the ground running, made, he's averaging 70 odd over five games, uh, which is, and he kind of held them together in that big win against Gloucestershire. Gloucestershire it was an amazing two, win. Two uh, wickets. An chasing incredible game. 200 in the last session. Yeah. And an incredible game. Yeah. Incredible game. Um, and, you know, heartbreaking for Gloucester, really, who have really struggled. They haven't had an ounce of luck. They've mm. had a lot of injuries. It was their big, big year out. A big, big kind of graduation ceremony, if you like. You know that they've been, they were waiting two years to to actually get their get their go in the top division, and it's it's almost certainly going to end in relegation. But look, North Hans have done brilliantly to to get to where they are, and if they if they hang in, and they will almost certainly, then immense uh, praise goes to them. John Sadler's a very good young coach there, very good young English coach. Looking at their squad at the start of the season when we were doing our predictions, I have to say I didn't think they'd win a game this year. This is it. I, I thought they would exactly. be but bottom they, by a distance. But they hang in games. They haven't won that many because they don't have an explosive bowling attack. You know, Ben Sanderson is their key man and he's a, obviously a county warhorse, you know, but he's still a medium pacer. So they don't have Division 1 explosivity to get rid of teams. But uh, they hang in there. They've only lost two games in 10 all year, which is excellent. Um, we had a question. I, I, sorry, I can't remember the, the name of the person who asked it. Basically asking about Gloucester's season. And if you compare the two of them, they both came up in 2019 to, inverted commas, unfancied counties. Gloucester really struggled. They've lost eight out of 11. I think the, the big difference is that you've had players at North Ants who've really stepped up. That you might Luke Proctor. Luke Proctor's had an amazing season. I just get get his numbers up. I think he averages something like 90 with a bat. Yeah, he's made 800 plus runs. Um, and again, journeyman cricketer was at Lancashire, you know, didn't pull up any trees there. And mm. has, has done really, really well at North Hence this year. But there are, there are others as well. He signed a new contract, but Sanderson signed a new contract as well. 
Um, and they've signed somebody else recently as well on a on a three year uh, whose name um, is so, so me. <laughs> Jack White is a seamer who's a kind of classic Northant signing, someone who's come into the first class game late. Um, and he's been averaging about 20, 20 with the ball in Division One this year, so alongside Sanderson. Rob Keogh has had a really good all round season. Um, so just a lot of players who with no Division One experience before have done have done really well. And, we've, and conversely, with Gloucestershire, uh, like, so, uh, with, aside from Chris Dent, basically, and Miles Hammond to a degree, their batting hasn't really fired and they've been really short with the ball. Um, obviously, Nassim Shah only playing one game when he was supposed to be the gun overseas. They've been unlucky up. with injuries to their quicks mm. in particular. And But you're right, I think looking down... The expected 11 for Gloucester and North Hans at the start of the season. Gloucester looks to have the more talented side, but have underperformed uh, when they were going to have a struggle on to stay up anyway. And North Hans have, have massively overperformed. And it's it's a really, it's, it feels absolutely right. It's a really good story that, you know, won't be picked up by anyone apart from us and maybe not a couple of podcasts <laughs> and a few North Hans fans. But yeah. that doesn't mean it's not worth telling. Yeah. Um, the Commonwealth Games has started and it will finish by the end of this week. England are two wins from two. Um, Alice Capsey has scored 44 and 50 in her two innings so far, doing so with a with a pretty bad black eye, actually. What happened um, there? I'm not sure, but it's, it's pretty bad. I'll have to ask H. <laughs> oh, it was in the, I think it was in a warm-up. I think she got hit in okay. the face during a warm-up. Yeah, I mean, yeah. She, it must it must impair her vision to, to a certain degree. There's um, not much evidence of it. I saw the highlights. <laughs> I didn't see it live, admittedly, but I saw the highlights of her 50-odd um, mm. against South Africa. And she's great to watch so strong through the offside in particular and it is a mark of the women's game it was actually pointed out to me by Ali Maiden who was the women's batting coach until recently and he worked with a lot of the players and he said that in the men's game which relies more on muscle or yeah kind of using the pace ball as well muscle, yeah then you get players who, who tend to stick it over mid wicket but on instinct now whereas with the women's game there's a bit more finesse to it and they are more offside dominant you see it with Danny Wyatt in particular, who's lethal through the offside. You saw it all the way back with Charlotte Edwards. You see it with Meg Lanning, who's lethal square of the wicket, wicket on the offside. And you saw it in that innings from Capsey. Um, eight or nine fours, most of them in that arc between mid-off and cover point. Um, she gives herself a bit of room, throws her hands at it really nicely. I know this is poor form to compare to, to, to male cricketers, but she reminded me a bit of Matt Pryor, actually, when Pryor was playing well, he used to open up that offside and, and he was very free, but there was a kind of compactness to it as well, a real snap in the wrists. And she's got that. She hits it hard, but she hits it with, with finesse. And she's got a real all-round game. I mean, she is, she's only 17, isn't she? I think she's going to go all the way and then some. I was just thinking as well, because we've, I think in past pods, we've said, Where, where's Capsie? Why is she not in England squad? Why didn't she go to the World Cup or even play in the Ashes? But I was thinking this morning, actually, I think, She's been managed really well. I think Lisa Cartley's done well there because she is only 17. We interviewed her for the magazine last year. She said herself she's a home girl. She hasn't been away from home that much. Actually, taking her to Australia for what was an epically long tour and the first half of it extremely chastening, that could have done a young player like Capsie quite a bit of damage. And actually, how much was there to gain from it when she'd have been a bit part player? Whereas now, this summer, she's playing in front of home supporters uh, she can be looked after in a way that you probably can't on tour. Uh, and now she's got the opportunity to play in not only a cricket tournament, but a world sports tournament uh, and getting the kind of spotlight in a in a very different way to, she, to the way she would have done in Australia. So I think Lisa, Lisa Cartley probably deserves a bit of credit, particularly given that we've probably criticised her in the past. And, and, and also, you yeah, know, you're exactly right. She also couldn't buy a run in domestic cricket early in the year as well. So like young players will go through periods like that. So allowing her to have that those periods... Uh, away from the public eye, I guess, and kind of waiting waiting for the right moment to, to give the opportunity. Um, the opener was a really good game between Australia and India. Australia recovered from 49 for five to chase down 155. Ash Gardner hit an unbeaten 52 from number six. Um, the other big news from the women's game this week is that Deandra Dottin has announced her retirement for playing for West Indies, essentially blaming negative team environment. Um, Dustin, who's got the fastest T20i ton in the women's game, said that the current climate and, and team environment has been non-conducive to my ability to thrive and reignite my passion. Obviously a huge loss for West Indies, but also the women's international game who've lost two massive names in Dustin and Lizelle Lee in the space of a couple of weeks. 
Um, just going to run through quickly other stuff that's happened in international cricket. Sri Lanka levelled the Test Series against Pakistan to continue the Chris Silverwood revolution. Ovid McCoy took a six for in West Indies' second T20I win over India. And Zimbabwe's Ryan Burl hit Nasum Ahmed for 34 and over as Zimbabwe beat Bangladesh 2-1 in a T20I series. Um, Phil, what is your moment of the week? I can't remember. Mark Taylor? Yeah, that's right. I spoke to, to Tubbs, who I didn't call him uh, that. Uh, I spoke to Mark Taylor at midnight on Sunday night. Uh, I'd been at a wedding, got back, uh, feeling a bit ragged. And he didn't half perk me up. We had a half hour chat. Uh, Bow? I've never met him before, but I got his number off, off, a, off a mate and dropped him a text. And he said, and he responded with, good day, Phil. That was literally his first line on the, on the, the WhatsApps. He had me at good day. And we had a lovely chat. It was eight o'clock in the morning at Sydney, Sydney time. And uh, he was literally just pumped up in bed. Um, and you, I heard his wife ask if he wanted tea or coffee. And she, she pootled off and got, brought, brought him back a coffee. Uh, he found his earphones and we had a half hour chat about captaincy, modern, modern captaincy and the evolution of modern captaincy, obviously in the context of what Stokes is doing, experimenting with. And it came out nicely, Joe, did it not? It did. I've just subbed it. So the magazine goes to print in a couple of hours. We shouldn't be speaking to you, Yaz, no. really. Um, no, it's, it, it, as you say in the piece, like it, there's not much, there couldn't really be a better person to go to in this terms of it. redefining captaincy and what, yeah. what he did with that Australian side. Yeah, I actually left quite a lot of it out for a potential down the line piece because he, he wasn't the, the trailblazer of that Australian setup. He, he, as he said to me, carried on what was already in place in Australian cricket. Uh, but he was he was the first person to say we want to bat we want to score at four runs and over. He also told me that even in the nineteen eighty nine Ashes, when he made eight hundred odd runs as a as a youngish left hand opener and made three hundred in a shared three hundred partnership in a day with Jeff Marsh, they'd already Bob Simpson and Alan Border had already put in place you have to score at least three hundred runs a day. So that was already in place in nineteen eighty nine. Really? Yeah, which I'd never heard before. Uh, and Australia rewrote the rules from the start of that decade onwards. And he was a key, um, he was part of that philosophy. He, he, he cultivated it, if you like. Uh, immensely respected bloke, but a really, really lovely fella as well. And I think we saw that people who have Sky and would have watched that Lord's Test match where he, he came over, in part because it was the Shane Warne game and he obviously captained Warne and stood at first slip and managed Warne brilliantly uh but he, he left a, an impression on on all of us who watched that test match i think um th- he's just got class and integrity really and his his reading of a game of cricket second to none so so we had a we had a lovely chat probably more lovely for me than him it was eight o'clock in the morning and he was you know, plumped up in bed but uh yeah he's my new favorite cricketer um uh and yeah he was very interesting actually on um, it's that phrase again, direction of travel of test match cricket. And he has, it's, he said for the last 10 years, he's been talking about four day test cricket. And he's been saying that if, if we want the game to, uh, to thrive and flourish and, and stay relevant in these hurtlingly fast times, then four day cricket has to be a, a proper conversation that people, that grown up people have. Um, Although he did acknowledge the threat that that might pose to spinners. He did. As absolutely. Well. He did. Um, but he, he comes at it from a perspective of pragmatic pragmatism, but also as a naturally creative and expansive captain. And one, one thing to say for four-day cricket, four-day test cricket, admittedly over 100 overs, so ideally you're playing four and a half days anyway. One thing to say for it is that the more adventurous captains will come to the fore because you can't let a game drift and play out. Uh, you have to engineer uh, and get creative in in that in in a game of cricket, and that would naturally feed into the way that Stokes wants to do it, for example. Uh, so anyway, look, it was an interesting chat, and it comes out next week in in the old magazine. Um, on Mark Taylor showing integrity around the Lords Test match, um, right. I was I ordered a coffee in the the Lords press box coffee bit, and I've, he, Taylor came after me. I've never seen anyone. Um, want to make sure that the queue had been respected as much as him. He he turned around and so sincerely said, have you been served? 
That's but, lovely. Um, so yeah, he's got really sparkly uh, eyes, isn't he? Really, really didn't, alive. Didn't notice at the time, but yeah, um, very I'm nice. I'm glad man, you said sure. that. I thought you were going to counter that. And no, say no, no, stole no, your not coffee, at all. But, not at all. Okay, good. Um, uh, there's a bit of um, skullduggery by an Australia A player, Bryce Street, in a club game between Frinton and Saffron Walden CC that has uh, done the rounds on the internet. Basically, Street walking back to his mark when the ball appeared to be dead, but clearly wasn't deemed to be by the umpire. He threw the ball out of the stumps with the batter marginally out of his crease. He appealed and the batter had to go. Um, the batter was 18-year-old Nikhil Garantler, who last month scored a double hundred for Essex Twos against Yorkshire. Also playing for Essex Twos that day, Phil, Good was... Link. Grant Rolofsson, who has since been <laughs> signed up to play in their 50 overside in the Royal London. I played against him, infamously played against him yeah, a few weeks ago. Yeah, you mentioned a few weeks ago on the podcast. 130 in about 10 minutes against our first team in the Essex League. Mm. Um, yeah, Essex are really pleased about this. I spoke to somebody there uh, and they see it as a real coup that they've got hold of him. He's 25-year-old. He'll, he'll go really well. Um, just on that skullduggery, um, sure, pretty, as they like to say in Australia, ordinary behaviour by the Aussie. But what are you doing, mate? Why are you out your ground? Why are you out of your ground? What is wrong with you? I'm afraid. Well, it goes around, you know, and if you're dozy and you're up against an Aussie overseas who's paid by the by the, the run and the run out and all the rest of it, no doubt, allegedly, um, then just ground your bat in, pal. It was what the celebration doing? after that made it, though. <laughs> that, that, yeah, yeah. That was... yeah. Street, streets ended up scoring 100 in that game as well. Of course he did. Um, uh, Sam writes in to say, in contrast to the recent email, I love your pod voice, Yaz. I do, however. There's a lot of this. The, yeah, yeah. You know, we've a lot got, of positive we've got a lot affirmation of, on A uh, lot of voice chat. You are on shameless, Twitter. Um, you however, that, that, Hang on, hang on, hang on. That, that's not why I've, I've, I've mentioned Sam's email. I do, however, find Joe and Phil have the same voice, and I'm just convinced that it's Yaz and a mate putting on voices to make it seem like <laughs> a bigger operation. Um, I think you guys sound really different. I mean, me too. <laughs> Well, also judge it by how long I speak for. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the way to tell the difference. Yeah, very good. Yeah, very um, good. Well, well I, I'm, I'm delighted if I sound like, like the ineffable Joe Harmon. I'm all over that. And, and the other thing we mentioned in the last pod is if you give a five-star pod review, you're allowed to slag us or particularly me off. And we had another one this week. So there's one five-star review that said... It's not about me. I'm very fragile. It's not about you. <laughs> it's slagging me off again. Um, best cricket pod by far. Uh, always fair and balanced and hugely entertaining. But the way Yaz dresses is really disconcerting. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think I dress that well, but I don't think I dress that badly on the I pod. I say it's disconcerting. Yeah. Um, Maybe underwhelming at under times. Yeah, <laughs> underwhelming is probably you, you, fair. Your, your problem oh, here we is, go. is your shirts up top. They, okay. they kind of tend to, to, to crumple up around okay. your collar. And so they need to be better fitted. Basically, yeah, because you, yeah. you're quite... You're a bit Ned Flanders, aren't you, across your chest? <laughs> well, I don't know if this is deliberate, but today you're looking pretty good. Thank well, blatantly you, it's deliberate. <laughs> you knew this was coming. But yes, um, sometimes your shirts, they ride up a little bit. Okay. It makes you look a little bit like you're kind of wearing an undershirt, okay. you know? Okay. Just slightly better shaped shirts, better fit shirts, and you'll, you'll be golden. Cool. Moving on. Um, Bobson. I like that. it when you wear your bomber jacket over your shirts, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit you, too warm for that. You're often when it's yeah. quite warm. When you first joined us, of course, you wore that ludicrous black, huge... I still, I still have that. Yeah, I don't want to see that. that come winter. I don't <laughs> want to see that. That's been consigned. I think, I think we really You've need to move on. You've got a profile. I think we need to move on. profile now. Get rid of that jacket. I think we need to move on. Um, Bob's and Dugnet asks, um, what famous chain restaurants would cricketers be? I'll go first. This is him. Stuart Broad is, Na Stuart Broad is Nando's. Extremely cheeky, but can also get a little bit spicy. Um, Joe, you said you've got an answer for this. Well, hello, Bobson as well. I know Bobson personally, although that is not his real name. Okay. Um, mine was, uh, yeah, J Jason Roy, the test batter, and Jamie Oliver's Italian. And it seemed like a great idea at the time. <laughs> but actually, it was a round peg in a square hole and was quickly forgotten about. That's um, good that because he, he good. backed Jason Roy. And, and Jamie's Italian. And you can guarantee <laughs> he's, he's trod the balls at Jamie, Jamie Oliver's Italian. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've got nothing on this aside from a rather rather laboured Jimmy Anderson Pizza Express comparison. But Go for I it. I'm just going to leave it there. Okay. But, okay. Time, timeless? Is that where you... Timeless, consistent, always delivers, blah, 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 blah. I, I still go back to Pizza Express, by the way. This is, as, I, as me and my sister like to say, this, it's a reason it's a chain. The reason it's a mm. chain. Consistent class from, from start cool. to finish. And they're not even advertisers and, uh, on the podcast. And, and, and a part of, my, part of my childhood and adulthood, just like Jimmy. 
Excellent. Um, and, and finally, a month or so ago, we talked about a raffle competition. Um, friend of the show, Joel Lammy, has a campaign to build disabled toilets in Peterborough. To enter, you had to donate five quid, and the raffle prize was a couple of tickets for day three of one of the South Africa test matches. Um, Joe, we have a winner of that competition. Yeah, well, thanks to everyone who got involved and donated. Uh, Joel was very grateful to receive that, and it's a really good cause. Uh, somewhat embarrassingly, <laughs> the winner, as picked by Joel, I should add, not by us, uh, is Phil's best man and a close friend of mine too, uh, Greg Hensman. So congratulations. Mm. We, we were thinking, should we just not give it to Greg? But that didn't seem very fair because he has donated. And yeah. Joel, it was all above board. So Greg wins the test tickets to see England v South Africa at the Oval. I think it was day three. Uh, congratulations, Greg. I guess he might even invite one of Phil or I, which would be deeply <laughs> that, suspicious. Be really so he's, that can't he's happen. He's not doing that. He's that a jammy bastard, I'll tell you that. Uh, and the runner-up uh, winning, I think it was a bottle of rye whiskey and some beers, some wisdom beers, uh, was Josh Taylor, who none of us have ever met. So Fantastic. that is absolutely legit. Bit of legitimacy. I yeah. bet he's a better bloke than Greg Hensman. <laughs> uh, I will be emailing Josh and probably seeing Greg quite soon to, to, <laughs> to inform them of their prizes excellent mm. um, not a great look but look, <laughs> we're honest what can we say um thanks again for everyone who donated and got involved with that competition um that's the end of today's show cheers phil cheers joe this has been the wisdom cricket weekly podcast we'll be back next week for our look back of the 2003 england south africa series <laughs>